Hey, good morning, Cornerstone. Today we're continuing in our series, Growing Faith, a study in the book of James. Uh, many people, if they're willing to admit it, have found their faith growing fairly stagnant these days. And there's a host of things that we blame for it. COVID-19, racial unrest in our country, uh, political commentary and criticism. But we can't allow these external things to stop or, or even to slow down the growth in our faith. If you have your Bibles with you today, I would encourage you to, to turn with me to James chapter 4. Last week, Pastor Matt uh, challenged us about making sure that our motives are right, that we're doing things in the right motive. Well, today we're sort of picking up where he left off in uh, chapter 4, verse 11. Now, I'd love to tell you that today is going to be more pleasant than last week, but unfortunately, we're going to be talking about arrogance today. And just so that we're all on the same page, I've got a simple definition of what arrogance is. It's a sense of superiority, entitlement, or self-importance. Now, most of us that would call ourselves Christ followers would like to believe that, that we don't have an arrogant bone in our body. But if we look deep down inside, we all have an area or maybe other, many areas where we feel superiority over others. That maybe we, we think we bring more value or we have things or we are able to do things because we're entitled to that. Or, if we're being honest, sometimes we just believe that we may be more important than someone else. I used to be a car guy. Now, you wouldn't know that from my current ride, a 1995 Acura Integra with 220,000 miles on it. Or my previous ride before that, a 93 Chevrolet Silverado with over 200,000 miles. Or any of the other cars that I've driven for the last 25 years. But back in the day... Back in the day, I had some sweet rides, some fast, some just beautiful cars. And my favorite was hands down uh, 1978 Z28 Camaro. Man, yeah, she was sweet. Pure black, not a speck of rust, 350 engine. It was automatic, but it had a shift kit built in, which basically meant that from a dead stop, if I put my foot on the gas, she would just fly for about 150 yards and then the rear end would bark, tires, and then I'd be gone. Hardly anything could catch me. I felt superior to most. I felt self-important. And, and I felt entitlement every time I drove that. But here's the thing. <laughs> we had three cars. My, my wife had the family car, the bigger car with the uh, baby seat in the back. And then I had a, a hoopty car that I drove back and forth to work. And um, one, one day I had to run an errand and my wife had her car, the family car, behind my baby, the Z. So instead of just dealing with moving cars around, I, only had to, I was only going to be gone a few minutes. I took, uh, I took the family car and I barely got out of the neighborhood before I was T-boned. Totaled her car totaled the family car. So I found myself putting the car seat in the back of my Camara and allowing my wife to drive that while I drove the hoopty everywhere. And it was okay because my wife didn't drive that much. She worked from home and the only time she had to go out was when she had some errands to run. Well, one day while I was at work, she had to drive to a doctor's office that she was doing some work for. And she, she knew that the car was overheating. So she had seen me do this before. She pops the hood and tries to release the pressure off the uh, radiator cap, and it blows up in her face. It goes all around her neck and leaves a permanent scar. You know, after that day, I didn't feel superior or self-important or entitlement when I drove that car. I no longer washed and, and waxed it every week. I, I, I no longer even drove it around just on the weekends. I turned it into my work car. And shortly after that, 
I, uh, I had an accident on, the, on a bridge where I slid into a guardrail to avoid another accident during a snowstorm. Put a big old dent in the rear quarter panel. And shortly after that, I, I sold that car. Now, a lot of people would say, well, you know, that was just a series of accidents. But for me, my arrogance and self-worth about what I drove brought me to my knees during that time. And now I pretty much view my transportation as just something to get me from point A to point B. Now, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he was the pastor of a church in Jerusalem. And, and I've known quite a few pastors that have written books that have been based on a message or a series of messages that they've delivered to their congregation. And, and I can't help believe that this book, while inspired by God, was probably written in part due to what James was teaching the church at this time. And this was not written to, to woo unsaved people to follow Christ, but to clean up the lives of those that thought they were Christ followers. And in this portion of the text that we're looking at today, there had to be something that had risen up in the, in the people of the church where they were trying to, to elevate their own standing. I mean, some had gone so far as to internally, intentionally destroying someone else's character in order to gain one-upmanship and get what they thought would be control of the church. Now, James was, was calling the church to, to rise above this petty yet dangerous problem. And while I'm sure that he knew that this was a catalyst for um, their approach to spiritual growth, I bet that he was also concerned about what giving the local church an ugly reputation among the community would look like. Because very seldom does an internal disruption stay internal. And sadly, for today's church, uh, we're no less immune from that sort of thing from the church that James was writing to so many years ago. I get a, uh, I get a blog post uh, in my email box every week that shares some of the latest news articles, the most important that uh, pastors and others might find that pertain to Christianity. And just this past week, there was an article about a church that's going through some major issues and major splits. And I'm sure that many of us have seen uh, a church that has dangerous accusations. And rather than stopping and discussing it like Christians, they choose to, to throw stones at one another in order to gain control or one-upmanship. Well, James tells us in verse 11 of, of chapter 4, he says, don't speak evil against each other. Dear brothers and sisters, if you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's laws. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. So this is speaking against anyone publicly or privately. This is a very serious offense. Now, he's talking about slander. He's talking about backbiting. He's talking about backstabbing and evil criticism in an attempt to, to place undue, undeserving, and possibly unfair judgment on someone else. Now, James is not referring to uh, judgment in reference to a specific sin. We have clear issues in Scripture about how the church is to, to judge and to discipline in these areas. And he's not talking about going to a person that you have a conflict with and talking one-on-one -on -one to discuss the problem. No, he's talking about going behind the back of that person, judging their motives and their actions in areas of what could be personal preference or conviction where Scripture does not clearly speak or maybe speaking against things that are just disputable matters. You know what I'm talking about. Decisions that maybe you have made in your walk and in your life that other Christians have not made in theirs. James condemns this sort of activity for a very serious reason. And that reason is found in verse 12. He says, God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. 
So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Now, there was a time in my life where I had aspirations to be a lawyer. Now, my parents used to say it's because I like to argue all the time for no good reason. Maybe I should have gone into politics. I don't know. Uh, I would assume that most lawyers uh, would love to rise up to the bench. You know, instead of pleading their cases, that they would get to, um, to get to actually uh, judge and decide the outcome. And see, that's what happens to us um, when we think it's okay to judge someone else, someone else's actions, their, their motives, and maybe even judge their punishment. Sometimes we want to be the, the judge, jury, and the penal system for those that, that we think are doing wrong. But see, whenever we do this, we're showing contempt for God's court. See, when we're doing this, we're assuming a position that's reserved for God. The Apostle Paul reiterated this in his letter to the Romans in chapter 14. He says, so why do you judge? Why do you judge another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the Scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Now these verses, they sort of take the wind out of our sails when we consider judging others. But when we stand before a holy God, we will only, we will only have to give a personal account of our actions. I'm reminded of, a, of another verse that, that says we've all sinned and fall short. And if, if we're being honest with ourselves, I'm sure we can recount a time or two where we found ourselves falling into the judgment zone and thought of us as being superior over another person's actions or questioning another person's motives. But you see, when we live out these verses in every circumstance, we find that arrogance is crushed when God alone is the judge. It's crushed. See, when we alone let God and, and God alone be the judge, we put, support, we put superiority in the right hands. He alone is the judge, not us. Now, before we go on, I, I, I have a question for you. Uh, by a show of hands, and yes, those of you that are watching online, we want you to participate with us. How many of you have made plans, work plans, school plans, vacation plans, in the last, I uh, say, seven to eight months that you've had to change? I see all these hands going up. <laughs> Thank you. Now, my wife and I, we planned a Caribbean vacation last summer for this fall. So excited about that. And then they shut down the Caribbean. We put down a hefty deposit, non-refundable, of course. <laughs> and, but fortunately, we have a little bit of a grace period. They gave us a six-month grace period. So hopefully we'll be going this spring. But I know that it's safe to say that a lot of people's plans and life have not made sense in 2020. And I've heard people question, how could God allow this to happen? And, and I've repeatedly said that I believe that God has allowed this pandemic to happen just to see what his kids are going to do. Apparently, James had some concerns about some plans that the members of the church were making in Jerusalem. We pick it up in verse 13. He says, look here, you who say today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town and we will stay there a year and we will do business there and make a profit. Hmm. <laughs> you know, what James is telling us is that we are making future plans isn't sinful or wrong. Because the Bible views planning and preparation as a virtue. The Proverbs are filled with the wisdom of planning and executing upon a plan. That's not what James is saying. So what's happening here? James's point is that since human life 
and human plans, even our own existence, is insignificant, then why we should we be doing this? Because one day we're going to quickly disappear. He says in verse 14, your life is like a morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. You know, that tells me that all of us, knowing that our life is not only really insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but we're only here for a little while. We ought to be thinking about greater matters. Matters that that deal with our faith and our submission to God's will. Now, our future plans, which could be good, should be informed by, they should be driven by, they should be fueled by God's will for our lives. It's not that if you have a vacation planned in November that that's bad. It's rather, what's driving that vacation? What's driving that business plan? What's driving your plans? That's what ultimately matters. And you see, if we believe in a God who's created us, a God that has a a mission for each and every one of us, who He is and what He has called us to be is what should drive all of the plans in all the areas of our life. Now, I'm not talking about what socks you choose to wear today or what shirt or blouse you've chosen to wear. And I don't even care what you're buying at the store. But it's those daily decisions where we act like the church in Jerusalem, assuming that we have all the time in the world to do basically whatever we want, whatever we will. You know, every time I read verse 14, I'm reminded of a song a friend of mine wrote a long time ago. Life is a vapor. So quickly fading. It only lasts a season, then it's gone. But I have chosen to live each moment depending on a strength beyond my own. How often do we ask God about our plans and our dreams? We just assume that what, whatever we do is going to be good with God. Now, God is not against our making plans, but why should we expect God to bless our plans when they may not be the plans that He intended for us. I mean, why would God bless what He's not been involved in making? I know this sounds kind of brutal, but think about all the major plans that you've made in your lives without consulting God before you made the plans. I mean, how many, how many times do we, we make the plans and then we pray and ask God to bless them? James goes on to say in verse 15, he says, what you ought to say is if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. I remember when I was a little kid just a few years ago growing up in Alabama, there was a woman who was like a second mother to me, Betty Sue Smith. And whenever we wanted reassurance that something was going to actually come to fruition, she would always promise, if the good Lord's willing and the creek don't rise. Yeah, I can tell some of you probably heard that before. And the the version of the Bible that I grew up reading says, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. And I don't believe James is saying that every time we're planning a future event that we need to say, if the Lord wants us to. James does not condemn human planning. He condemns an arrogant attitude that fails to recognize the sovereignty of God. I mean, we are, we are free to uh, plan the details just like uh, the illustration um, of the merchants, the time, the place, the duration, the means, the goals. But the instruction here is to consider and recognize God's will in your planning. Because you see, arrogance is stifled when God arranges our plans. That's how we stifle arrogance, is allow God to be a part of our plans. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Matt talked about distinguishing between the the poser and the humble. And he told us about the poser. That's the person that walks the walk, wears the right clothes, reads the right magazines, reads the right books, knows the right things to say, but really can't even come close 
to what the person that's really living the life is. And that's the humble. And he said that a person with growing faith knows the good and knows how to do the good. So James concludes this section of our arrogance by really stepping on our toes, at least on mine. Verse 17. So whoever, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. Now, here's the thing that strikes me. I know I've been this way. We think that sin is doing things that God doesn't want us to do. We think that when we we sin, that we've been disobedient to God. We've broken a commandment, right? I mean, there's there's a whole list of commands where God says, do this, don't do this. And we see them both in the Old and the New Covenants. But here, God is talking about sin differently. God's telling us that sin is also when you don't do what I wanted you to do. These are the things that that God wanted me to to do in my life. Things that He wanted you to do in your life. You ever thought about that? And sometimes we're just too busy doing our own thing. We see a need and we hear we hear about an opportunity. And God, God could speak to us, maybe in that, that still small voice. Hey, I was looking for someone to do a job for me. So just come. Show up and let me show you what I can do through you. And we say, well, I'd like to, but Lord, right now, I'm really busy. It's not the right time. I've got a a lot of things to do, places to go, people to see. Oh, and by the way, while we're talking, um, I got some problems I'd like for you to sort out for me. And oh, yeah, and please bless me and my family. Most of the time we make bad choices and we know beforehand that it's bad. Bad choices, we know they're bad, but we do it anyway. That's the sin of commission. But then there's this knowing what we should do, the right thing to do, and just not doing it. And that's what we call the sins of omission. And many of us are guilty of that. We know that Someone needs a word of encouragement, and we don't give it. We know we're wrong about something, but we aren't willing to apologize for it. We know a situation is wrong, but yet we withhold information that could make it right. We withhold truth when someone needs help. We know that someone needs forgiveness, and we don't give it. See, James says that When we know the right thing to do, but we don't do it, it's sin. When we know the things that we should act on and don't do it, it's a sin. But by doing what is right is always, always the best results. Why? Because you never have to apologize for doing the right thing. And this too lies in with judging others, that first thing we talked about. Because, you know, if you are doing the right thing all the time, and you do the right thing, you won't have time to be judging others. So the bottom line is, arrogance disappears when we recognize sin in ourselves. Now, the problem with arrogance in the early church grieved this pastor enough that God gave him the words for this church. Now, The reason it's so devastating to the early church, and even more so today, is when we allow this to happen, not only does it divide us, but it gives the outside world good reason to judge us and judge our behaviors as followers of Christ. And those outside the church of God, the those people see our actions and they say, well, if this is what following God is like, what good is it? Now, I trust today that maybe those of you that came in and thought you didn't have an arrogant bone in your body, that you've seen the light, like I have. That part of our sin, part of our sin, you know, that thing that we all do, probably has at least a hint of arrogance in our way of thinking. 
But I want you to just imagine with me, just for a moment, a church where people didn't judge one another, didn't make false accusations or slander people in a power play. A church where all of the plans that, that were made, both personally, professionally, your family, your church life, were made with Christ at the center. And everyone here at this church knew the good and did the good. Can you imagine that? I mean, what a glorious church this would be. It's possible, you know. It just depends simply on you. We can put a stop or at least apply the brakes on any hint of arrogance in our lives when we remember these three things. Arrogance is crushed when God alone is the judge. And arrogance is stifled when God ar arranges our plans. And arrogance disappears when we recognize sin in ourselves. Now those of you that have been called Christ followers, those of you that have, have accepted Him and have made Him the leader of your, your life, what, what area or areas do you think you're on the struggle bus in today? What area do you need to go in your prayer closet and do some serious repenting? Uh, any of you feel like you've got all of these under control? And, and it could be, and if that's you, you really should talk to us about being part of the teaching team because you're better than I am. And for those of you that maybe you've never, you've never placed your personal faith and trust in Jesus and invited Him to be the, the leader of your life, I don't want you to think for a minute that, <laughs> that we are perfect, that we all have arrived. Because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. And there's steps that we all probably need to take today. But for those of you that maybe you've never invited Jesus to be the leader of your life, that's the step you need to take today. Would you... Everyone, just bow your heads for just a minute. Every eye closed. And I just want to, I just want to ask you straight up, where are you? Let God know right now what area of arrogance do you might have a problem with? Have you ever done, are you still doing some judging of your own and not allowing God alone to be the judge? If that's you, just, just lift your hand. No one's looking right now. Thank you. Or maybe, maybe some of you have realized in our conversation today that you make a lot of plans and ask God to bless them. And you need to go back to making some plans with God for the things that you need to do in your, in your life, in your family, in your business. If that's, if that's you today, would you, you just raise your hand. Just be bold. Raise your hand and let him know that this is you. And any of you out there that you feel like you, you're following the, the commandments, you feel like you're doing the things that, you're, that, that God wants you to do. But you know, if you're really honest with yourself, you find that there's probably some things that have passed you by that you, you weren't in tune to what God wanted you to do and you failed Him. If you've been arrogant about your, your sin, would you just raise your hand right now and let Him know? Thank you. Any of these areas that you're struggling with, I would just encourage you to, to take a moment either right after this service and just... Go to our website and just type in a prayer request because our prayer team would love to be praying for you. It's confidential. You don't have to worry. Your neighbors aren't going to find out. The other people are not going to find out. But God also hears your prayer. And for anyone in here today that has never professed Jesus as their Lord, I would just encourage you to do that today. Again, you can go right to our website under our next steps. And you can accept, put, just click the button that says that you're accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. 
And we'll follow up with you for some more information to help you down that path. But God will reward the decisions that you make today. But you've got to be willing to make the decisions. Father God, we just thank you for the time that we had together to to read and study into your word and just to bring what was going on in a church of Christ followers, people that were following you and areas that they failed you. And Lord, we know when we get right down to it that we too failed you. But God, we don't want to be that kind of church. We don't want to be that kind of person. We want to be the one that allows you to come alongside in every decision, in every area of our life and just shine that light and show us what we need to do. God, we're grateful for the opportunity to come together and to, and to, to worship as a, a family of God, to lift our voices in you. Because God, we know that no matter how bad and how evil this world seems, there is nothing better than the goodness of God. And we just want to lift our voices and praise you. And it's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen.